Hi, everyone. This is Neil from Dorkaholics. I know, and I'm Clayton Toniao. I am a director and screenwriter. I'm super excited to have you here, Clayton, but we'll just get into it. What was your life like before you started working in film? I mean, I was basically living the life that was expected of me. Uh, I worked a couple of different finance jobs out of college, and, and I also spent several years working in real estate development. That was a, the same industry that my parents were in. And, and most of the decisions that I made in my life were guided by my parents. You know, I needed a, a practical job that provided financial security, and there wasn't a lot of room for creativity in my life. But in my mind and in my heart, I was always a storyteller. You know, I, I had a need to tell stories and, and all those ideas and all that creativity that was in me was being suppressed by fear, you know, fear of not doing what was safe. So I, I eventually decided to leave the safe path and become a full-time filmmaker. And I didn't have any education or experience in video production, but I decided to just move out to LA and figure it out. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious. How did you make that crucial decision to just go all in on pursuing your passion and not that practical path that you were already on? The moment that I made the decision to go all in and pursue my passion was when I read this article online and it was, um, it was about the most common time of day that people will die of a heart attack and it's in the morning. And I came up with my own theory about why that is. You know, this isn't uh, backed by any medical research. Just this is the thought that came into my head in that moment that I read the article. And so my theory was that all of these people are dying of a heart attack in the morning because they aren't looking forward to the rest of their day. They probably have jobs that they're not passionate about. And the routine of, of getting out of bed and doing something that you don't want to do every morning is slowly killing you. So that's when I decided that I can't live a life where I don't have passion for my work because otherwise it's, it's going to kill me. Let's flash a little back towards that first year in LA. Like what was it like? And what was like the most memorable experience you had that really solidified your belief in going down this pursuit of filmmaking? Um, I moved to LA to make movies, but during that first year, you know, like I was, I was working a lot of miscellaneous things, um, you know, that weren't narratives, but, during that first year, I did get a taste of what it's like to come up with a movie idea that resonates with people. So uh, there, was this, there was this contest on YouTube that was sponsored by the Tribeca Film Festival, and it was called My Movie Pitch. Uh, so in the contest, you basically uh, record a video of yourself uh, and you pitch a movie idea, and then you, you upload the video to their channel, and then people on YouTube could uh, watch the movie pitches and, and vote for their favorite. So I pitched an idea that became a finalist and I won what they called a, a filmmaker starter kit. Um, so I won a MacBook Pro, I won the Final Cut Studio editing software, and I won a camera. So winning all that stuff from a movie idea was the reminder that I needed at that time that I was, I was on the right path. What was that pit, that award-winning pitch? What was the idea? Okay, so, <laughs> all right, so that, was, that was a long time ago, but let me, okay, so let me uh remember and then they recall how it goes okay so the the concept was about um a man who just went through this really ugly divorce he was depressed and so he was trying to purge himself of the past right um and so by by doing so he basically auctioned his life for sale so he uh was selling his his house his car all of his possessions, everything in his house. And he also was offering to introduce the buyer to his friends and family. He also worked out a deal uh, to where his employer would give the buyer of the auction his job or like a chance to get his job. So it was literally like auctioning his entire life for sale, right? And so um, the story follows two people. It follows this person who is auctioning his life, you know, like his journey of, of trying to... Uh, forget the past and trying to start a new life and, and start a new identity, you know, without any of his previous possessions. Right. But then the other, the other part of the film or, or where we kind of go back and forth is following the story of, of the guy who actually buys his life, you know, who actually uh, lives in his house and meets his friends and, and, and basically assumes his identity and, and, you know, what would lead someone to do that. Right. And so, so it, it was, it's obviously a drama, Right. And, and so what we would also be exploring is um, the, the tragedy 
for the buyer of this auction and what would lead someone you know, uh, to have so much heartache that they would not only leave behind their own past, but to actually assume the identity of somebody else. Oh man, I, I wish like you, you have time some, someday in the future, like actually work on that pitch. I think it's like a super fascinating idea. It could like not just be a movie. I could see that being a series because that slow build of like assuming someone's life. I hadn't thought about it until now. It was a long time ago, but yeah, I, I still love the idea. I think that, um, and, and if, if, you know, if, if I find anybody who is interested in developing it, you know, I, I did write a treatment for it. And, and here's the little tidbit I'll share is that it's actually based on a true story. There was someone who actually uh, auctioned his life for sale on eBay. Um, but what, what ended up happening with that auction didn't pan out in, in a very interesting way. Yeah, it's fascinating where like good ideas come from. Yeah, um, they can come from anywhere. From your experience, how does directing commercials compare and contrast with directing films? Well, when I'm directing a commercial, I have to respect the fact that I am being paid by a client to accomplish a goal or a set of goals for their brand. So with every commercial I direct, I, I want to make the story as impactful as possible. But I also know that it's not about me. You know, it's not about leaving behind an aesthetic signature going to tell people, you know, this is a film by Clayton Tony App, right? So um, the difference being that when I'm directing a narrative film, whether it's a short film or a feature film, it is going to represent who I am as a director and as a storyteller. And the style and tone of my commercials are, are, are wildly different from my narrative films because the commercials represent the brands. But uh, my films represent me. They represent my audience and they represent an experience I've created just for them. How do you want to affect the film industry? Well, first and foremost, I wanna make compelling films. And you know, that's always the primary goal. But in addition to what I wanna achieve artistically, I also wanna elevate Asian American representation. You know, and, and to me, it's not just about getting more Asians in movies. It's about the quality of the roles that we're given. Uh, it's about ending that desperation that so many Asian actors have felt that causes them to take on, you know, so many degrading roles, you know, like roles where they have to be the butt of a joke, where they have to speak with an exaggerated Asian accent, uh, you know, where, an Asi where Asian men have to be portrayed as, as asexual nerds and Asian women have to be portrayed as arm candy for white men. Now, the thing is, you know, we're, we're definitely seeing progress now in, in recent years, and, and I'm glad that we've got positive portrayals of Asians in movies like Crazy Rich Asians and, and Shang-Chi. But where we go from here is we need to see more milestones, more things that we've never seen before. Like, I, I want to see a full-blooded Asian actor play the president of the United States. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I, I want to see a, a gritty American film noir where an Asian actor plays the detective because I, I can't even think of any time I've seen that. You know, I want to see a horror film with Asian American leads. All those things that we're not used to seeing, we need to get American audiences used to seeing us in those roles. Yeah, all, all those like search circumstances you're thinking of, I'm thinking like we need our own Morgan Freeman, we need our yeah. own. Um, Forgetting his name. Yeah, we need an Asian James Bond. You know what I mean? Like we need all those things. Like we we need our own version. You know, and um, it's like it's it's kind of crazy when you think about it because you know just for so many years of us existing in this country, like why why can't why can't a studio think of a circumstance where we would be playing these roles? What advice or guidance do you want to impart to other people considering making the pivot to filmmaking or other creative work, despite not having a formal background or education in it? So the first advice I would give is to not do it at all if you're only doing it for money. Now, the, the reason I'm saying that is not because you can't make money as a creative professional. You, you definitely can. But if you're only motivated by money, you're probably not going to be very good at it because creativity doesn't come from greed. It comes from passion. Now, my other advice would be that... Um, while you're working your way up the ladder and learning the skills that you need to get to where you want to go, you need to leverage the skills that you already have to make a living in the meantime. You know, so you, you can't, it, it, let's just say, for example, if you want to be a director, 
and you have no experience directing, you can't expect people to pay you to do something you've never done before. But if you have experience as an editor or as a writer, or if you're just a really strong guy or girl who can carry a lot of heavy equipment, then take whatever paying job you can get with those skills, as long as the work is going to get you close to the people that you can learn from. No, that's like really good advice. It, it makes me think of all the people I, I've, I've met who say they want to do creative work, but when the going gets tough, when they, when they start thinking like, oh man, I, I want to go to music festivals. I want to go out. It's like um, sacrifices have to be made for your passion. Yeah, no, so true. And I mean, you know, you still can, you know, I've before, before COVID, I, I went to music festivals every year, you know, like you can still have fun. You can still live your life, but um, you know, you gotta be goal oriented, you know, like it's not about, you know, just, just going to parties and just pretending to be, you know, in the creative industry, like you, you have to put in the work and, and you'll enjoy the, the fruits of your labor so much more when you know that you've earned it. So speaking of your filmmaking career, you, you had an award-winning film, Suburban Jungle, which is about the Asian gangs of the 90s. And that's a theme that's been touched on by, before by films such as Better Luck Tomorrow um, and, and so on. How did you go about adding something new to this genre? Well, there's been a lot of films um, in the past about Asian gangs. Better Luck Tomorrow was not one of them. Uh, Better Luck Tomorrow is a film about the criminality that's associated with Asian gangs. Uh, but the characters in the, in the film weren't gangsters. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, there have been a lot of films like Gran Torino or The Corruptor uh, that do showcase Asian gangs. And what people are used to seeing in these films are Asian Americans or Asian immigrants mm-hmm. living in poverty and becoming criminals as a means of survival. But when I decided to make Suburban Jungle, I wanted to make a film about a very unique type of Asian gangster. Uh, not like what people have seen before. So these are not kids who grew up in the ghetto. These are not kids who are uneducated. These are kids with 4.0 GPAs who live in affluent suburban neighborhoods and are living double lives as members of some of the most violent gangs in America. And, you know, they're not they're not like the characters in Better Luck Tomorrow uh, because those guys, you know, were basically rich kids committing crimes against other rich kids. And, and there's even a scene where they get scared when they have an encounter with real gangsters. Um, but in, in reality, back in the 90s, uh, a lot of Asian American gangs had members from rich and poor neighborhoods and they had beef with gangs from everywhere. So it wasn't uncommon that someone who might have grown up in a multi-million dollar house in San Gabriel Valley could end up shooting somebody who lives in the most dirt poor neighborhood in Long Beach. You know, and a lot of these kids, they had a really bright future ahead of them. Uh, there, was, there was a story I remember from back in the day where there was this guy who was an AP student in his senior year in high school, and he was going to be valedictorian. Uh, and one day, a rival gang member shows up at a football game at his school and he shot that dude in the face. So instead of spending his graduation day delivering a valedictorian speech, he spent it in prison as a convicted murderer. And you know, so, so the, the duality of uh, the model minority Asian and the cold-blooded gangster is what I wanted to explore in Suburban Jungle. Uh, and tonally, I wanted to do something very different with Suburban Jungle than what we've seen from gangster films in general. Um, you know, gangster films are usually shot like a music video and, and they usually glamorize the whole lifestyle, right? And I didn't want to do that. I wanted Suburban Jungle to be a very unsettling film that's filled with suspense and a persistent feeling of dread concerning what's going to happen next. And my hope is, you know, when people watch this film, whether they're young or old, they'll realize that gang life really isn't that glamorous at all. On that note... Suburban Jungle opens up with a dialogue about the difference between loving our parents and respecting our parents. Why did you start the film with such a conversation? To put that scene in context, so so one of the characters uh, in the film mentions that he respects his parents, uh, but he doesn't love them. And when his friend asks him, what's the difference? He replies, if I love them, I wouldn't be so afraid of them. 
the reason I wrote this scene is because I wanted to give the audience a glimpse into the type of upbringing that these characters have had. You know, a lot of Asian parents, they raise their kids with an emphasis on discipline and fear. The fear of failure and the fear of disappointing them. And now this, this parenting style, it can be very effective in making your kids hardworking and it can also teach them respect. But when your childhood is consumed by respect and discipline without the balance of love and compassion, it creates a lack of empathy. And that lack of empathy can enable people to do terrible things when they grow up. So in this film, we've got some characters who do some really violent, sadistic things to another human being. Your psyche would need to be lacking a certain amount of compassion and empathy in order to be able to commit a crime like this. Now, I'm not saying that you know, all Asian parents are gonna raise their children to be sociopaths. You know, the, the characters in the film, so they don't represent all Asians, okay? So let me, let me make that clear. Um, but in this film, I wanted to illustrate a certain type of upbringing that I believe can contribute to people living this lifestyle. Wow. Yeah, it, it's definitely a good, uh, not case study or character study, but it's a good look in the hypothetical scenarios that I think many Asian Americans can relate to. Um, like, I, I, I personally don't think that this subculture is as prevalent as it was back in the 90s. There were hints of it when I was in high school, knowing some kids here, some kids there. But do you think the subculture still takes place on a similar scale or, or what? So there are still uh, a lot of Asian gangs in America, but this subculture, you know, where you have smart people with so much potential, you know, living these double lives, it, it seems a lot less prevalent. Um, so kids today, they're not willing to throw away their future the way that Asian kids from my generation used to do. Um, the real reason why so many Asians from the 80s and the 90s were willing to join gangs was because they needed a sense of belonging. You know, they needed to, uh, you know, they needed to be a part of something that felt uniquely Asian that they weren't ashamed of. So, you know, back then, right, there used to be three social classes where most Asians got categorized. Um, either you're an Asian nerd you're a whitewashed Asian, or you're an Asian gangster. So for those people who don't want to be a nerd and don't want to deny their Asianness in order to hang out with white people, they needed to resort to becoming a gangster or pretending to be one. And, and I'm obviously, you know, like this is, this is an exaggeration, but this is, I, I'm giving this as an example of, of stereotyping, right? Um, but today, Asian American identity has, has benefited from the progress we've made these past two decades, you know, as far as, as, far as Asian representation in media is concerned. So kids today, you know, they're able to see positive reflections of Asians in film, television, sports, politics, and, um, and now we don't need to join a gang in order to be proud of who we are. Yeah, I mean, I, I went to a high school that was, I think, Last time I checked was over 75% Vietnamese American, highest concentration of Vietnamese people outside of Vietnam. And it's interesting to look back and realize that all those different subcultures like drama geeks and jocks, those were like, I was in an ecosystem that allowed that to thrive to where you could have different interests that you didn't have to feel like, oh, do I have to be whitewashed? Because that doesn't really mean anything here when the majority culture is Vietnamese American. Yeah, it's so true. It's just, it's a, it's a different landscape. And, um, and I'm, I'm so happy that, you know, like the, that the environment is so different now growing up because I think, I think the you know, most important thing, you know, just for, every, for anyone of, of any race is, is that they are able to thrive in an environment where they can be themselves and they can, you know, figure out their own identity. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, before we close out, Clayton, where, where can people uh, follow up and discover you and your work? If you're interested in seeing Suburban Jungle, uh, it's currently streaming on Amazon Prime Video and Plex. Uh, you can find the film on either of those streaming platforms, or you can go to my website, claytontoniow.com. Uh, click on the trailer for Suburban Jungle, and you'll find the direct links in the video description. Um, and you can also follow me on Instagram at claytontoniow. Awesome. This has been an amazing interview. Thank you so much, Clayton. Thanks so much for having me.